I'm really looking forward today, pumped and excited to answer your questions that you've been asking me on my YouTube channel. It blows up every time I make a video. You guys have so many questions and I appreciate it. I can't get to all of them, but today I am going to answer 39, well, let's say over 30 questions. So the reason I like to answer questions that you leave on my YouTube channel is because if you ask the question and I have 139,000 subscribers, there's a good chance that there are hundreds of other people asking that or wondering that same question. So by answering your question, I feel like I'm helping a lot of other people out, not just one person. So let's get right into the 30 plus questions today. Can we get an update on this colony after the winter? I'm curious to see how bees are doing in your horizontal hive. Yeah, you know, um, I've mentioned this in a couple of past videos. And unfortunately, this hive did not survive the winter. I was not able to create any type of feeder that I wanted to put on there. I kind of ran out of time in the fall. And they had plenty of honey on board, and their mite levels were low. But as I've said in previous videos about this particular hive that I lost, um, I have never had any luck with a horizontal hive overwintering. You gotta remember that I live out on the prairie, Illinois, it gets cold. You know, we had that 30 degree below zero uh, spell, wind chill factor, Fahrenheit, and it was just miserable. And uh, that hive in particular stands up about, what, three feet on the legs. So they're just up there in the wind. Now, I know a lot of you will say, oh, I've overwintered hundreds and millions of horizontal hives and nothing has ever been wrong. I, I, I do it great, it's no problem. I do this and that. I understand that a lot of you are successful at doing it. In all my attempts, uh, back in the, a long time ago, I used to try some uh, top bar hives and those are or horizontal hives. No luck there overwintering those as well. The way that I overwinter my colonies works really well on Langstroth hives, not too good on my horizontal hives. Again, I'm not blaming the horizontal hive technique or anything or the hive itself. I just think that that's something that I need to put a lot more energy into. But you know, I'm a vertical hive kind of guy. <laughs> so that answers that question. They did not make it. How do you know what time of day to move your hives? I need to move two of them. The best thing to remember is when bees are foraging, they're busy, they're going back and forth out of their hive. And if you move them during foraging hours, then they're gonna come back and wonder, um, did our house go away? What happened? So you wanna move them after everybody is home. That's gonna be, you know, sundown to dark. That's when you wanna move. You wanna wait and then once they're all in there, screen them off, block them off, whatever you need to do. And then I prefer to move my hives in the dark when it is dark outside. Now I've done that a lot and I've gotten stung a lot moving bees in the dark. Things happen, things fall over, tops come off, whatever. But that's the best time that I feel it's uh, best advantageous for my bees to move them when it's dark. I get to the new location when it's dark, take, open up the hive, walk away, and then when the sun comes up, they're in a new place. Hello, David, what device are you using in this video that informs you of the pollen alerts? That's a good question. I made a video a while back and it showed the pollen that was in my area that it, anytime that my weather app detects some sort of an alert, whether it can be pollen or wind or rain or fog or something, it just gives an alert. And so that's the app. I'm using Weatherbug, but I think many apps will do that. Um, but that just uh, gives me a good clue too of what's actually producing pollen in my area. That's a good question. Uh, where do you get your burlap smoker fuel? Oh, I've made a lot of videos on this as well. And I realized that some of you for the first time are watching me and I appreciate that and that you may not have seen my other 700 plus videos that I've made. Okay, so I get that. So um, in the bottom of my description of every video that I make, I have more of the common things that I use in my videos and I leave links in there where you can purchase those. And so I'll do the same for burlap. Burlap has always been in my description in the, and down in the, below this video. And there's a link there where I buy it. I get it off Amazon. It's food grade quality um, burlap. And I'll tell you what, I can't believe that I ever use anything other than burlap. Burlap, uh, oh gosh, it is unbelievable. What I like most about it, it makes, well, two things that I like most about it is that it makes just such a dense smoke without a lot of heat or fire. It doesn't burn up really quickly. I love that. That's what you want. You want smoke. You don't need hot fire. The other thing I love about it, it doesn't burn up. I can put a wad, a rolled up wad of burlap in there and it will last me probably two or three inspections. Yeah, maybe at least two. So I just smother my smoker out. You know, I put a little plug 
in the top of my smoker and it goes out. And then next time around, I put a little um, shipping paper to start my burnt burlap up again and away it goes. It, it's insane. I love the burlap. I, I gotta tell you, don't fool around with anything else. Uh, get that burlap, cut it up. It comes in big sheets, but you can cut it up perfectly and you can watch videos that I've made where I show you how to do that, but it works out so well. That's where I get my smoke review. I'm getting my package on Saturday and it's supposed to be very windy. What do you recommend? Wow, nobody knows wind like me. Oh, where I live, it is always windy. In fact, it's so windy where I live that we don't really say, is it gonna be a good day tomorrow based on rain or sun? We base it off the wind. <laughs> I don't look at whether it's gonna be you know, raining or not. It's like, is it gonna be windy or not? Because I'm under the same scenario that probably you are. And yeah, here's the thing. When it's windy outside, uh, it gets so windy here that the bees won't fly anymore. And that's really sad. But if you're installing a package and it's windy, you just need to get the job done. As I like to say, cowboy up. Everybody say it with me. Cowboy up, go out there, install them. The bees aren't going to really mind. You're going to be shaking them in there. Whether they fly a lot, you know, they don't need to fly much the first day or two. You want them to get used to their home. I would just go out there, cowboy up, and get her done. Why didn't you look for swarm cells in either of the two deeps? Now, this was a video that I made, strategy for swarm control, uh, how to deal with swarm cells. Um, so several of you asked this question, and that's because I just made a video two days before this one, where I did look at all those other deep frames and we determined there were no uh, cells there. So there was really no need to go back out there and look again in the bottom. It probably would have helped a little bit, but here's the deal. When I made these videos, and still it's this way, it's not really swarm season yet. It's still too cold to do much. That was just a, a nice warm up day that I could get out there and do something in my, in my beehives but it's not warm enough to treat it like the middle of spring or the middle of summer. It's still too cold. And so that's why I'm not jumping the gun and worrying too much about are there swarm cells? And because they can build them pretty fast. Now, before I answer the next question, let me encourage you to please join me on my live stream. If you like this format of me answering questions, you'll love my live stream because I just simply take a good half hour on every live stream or longer and allow a chance for you to interact with me and ask your dying to know answers to your questions, and I do my best to answer your questions every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central Time. I'd love for you to join me. We oftentimes have special guests, or we might have uh, special giveaways. It's a fun time to interact with a great beekeeping community. Check it out. Here's the link right here. Now let's get back to our next question. Thanks, David and David. So very new to Varroa here in uh, Sydney, Australia. New to them. How long do you have to have a brood break and what would be the best time of the year to use this, please? Now, what uh, what they are referring to here is this. Dr. David Peck uh, mentioned uh, using this to make a brood break. Now, I've always mentioned a push-in queen cage so that you can isolate the cage, uh, the queen in a cage. You can combine, um, confine her there and she can't lighten it. What we're trying to do is break the bee's brood cycle because mites reproduce in cap cells of bees and of the pupae. So uh, David uh, Peck mentioned putting the green drone comb in one of these types of, um, you know, queen excluder material. Uh, looks like it's gonna take up the space of about two frames. You're gonna lose some, some brood frames, but uh, this is the way you could isolate your queen in here. And what she does lay is gonna be on uh, it's going to be brood anyway, or drones anyway. And so that's kind of neat because then you can go and just freeze this drone frame and you're going to kill all the mites anyway. Um, it's not a bad idea. I'm stuck on using my queen pushing cage just because it's simple and they're cheaper. These, um, I got these from Better Bee. They do sell these and I think they work great. But if you have a whole bunch of hives, um, these are going to cost you a lot more money than a pushing queen cage. That's the only reason I like to push in queen cage. But to answer your question, um, we prefer isolating our queen, I do, in the months of somewhere around July, August, September, or August, September, October. And what we're attempting to do is that's when the, the mites accelerate the fastest because the bees are creating so many generations of, of bees by that time. And that's where the mites are gonna reproduce. So that's why we're working hard in July, August, September to really keep our mites under control going into winter. So those are the months that we target. It doesn't have to be exact, but August I know is just one of the months you have to really drill down and make sure mites don't expand rapidly. 
but do it in July, you get a head start on August. So I like July, August, September. Thank you for sharing. I really enjoyed this video and it helped a lot. I do have one question now that you've seen these queen cells and you've delayed swarming by destroying the cells. What are your next steps splitting the hive? That's a very good question. And uh, I've thought a lot about it. My go-to technique is one that I just made a video on. The last video that I made, I showed you how I would go to a hive like this one you're asking about. I'd pull out five, six frames from the parent colony and I'd make a split, take the queen with me. It doesn't matter if you take the queen or not, but I prefer to take the queen to simulate a swarm. And, um, but on this particular hive, I'm wanting to really raise queens from this queen. So that's gonna create a different scenario. I've thought a lot about it. I haven't made up my mind yet. You know, I thought about things like, um, pulling the queen out um, and then putting in some graphs and let them raise graphs, an easy way to raise some queens that way. And then I thought about just all different scenarios. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do. Probably what happens to me is I sit around and wonder, uh, I have about 10 plans that I'm thinking of that would re really work well. And what happens with me is I sit around and I can't make up my mind and I wind up doing nothing and they wind up swarming on me. Um, that's probably what, could happen. No, I hope not, but I have that tendency to be like that. Um, but I do want to raise queens from this queen. In fact, I'm wanting to give one of these uh, queens that I raised from this hive, and you've seen this hive, and I know you love it. Um, I'd like to uh, give away a, at least one or two hives on my live stream. And uh, so once I raise these queens, I guess I could give them away before I raise them, just send it to you when I get them. But um, these are great queens. Uh, this queen is great, and I'm sure her offspring will be very, very good. And, uh, but I am looking forward to raising queens. So hopefully that will go well. I, so I don't know what I'm gonna do yet. All right, where did you get that vac? That's referring to a small little vac that I bought off Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description below. And that vac works really well. I got the idea. I don't remember his name exactly. Don't, don't, don't kill me if I'm wrong, but I think he has a YouTube channel on beekeeping. And I think his name is Bug Farmer maybe, but he had a video where he showed how he made one he just bought one and then converted it, doing a lot of different conversions to it to make it a, a beetle sucker. And so after watching his video, I thought, well, I'm gonna try to get one too. I'm still wanting to make a video showing you uh, how I'm gonna make it. Uh, a little bit different than he made it, I think. Uh, he did a great job, but I, I think they work out really well. The one thing I'm wrestling with is, it's easy to suck a, a bee or not just, you know, they won't necessarily fit into the hole, but you'll destroy the bee. If you touch and get anywhere near a bee, they're so light that you'll suck them up in there. Add it. Got it. So you have to be careful not to kill your bees. And that's, that's the case when you're trying to smash beetles as well. Uh, anytime you're trying to vacuum up beetles or smash beetles, even collect them on the Swiffer pads, you know, some bees get caught. So I guess there's collateral damage when you're trying to kill beetles, but uh, I'll keep you up to date on that. Might make a video on showing you how I use that. Uh, do sweets retain, oh, do suits. Do suits retain uh, attack pheromone? Should they be washed or sprayed? That's a very good question. Um, I think pheromones, most pheromones really do uh, stick around for a long time. We, we see this with drone congregation areas. Um, they're all usually often they're in the same location, even though all the drones that were there the previous year died and no other drones know to go there. That could be landmark and all that. But the other thing I notice about pheromones is like queens in a tree or something where you get a swarm in a tree and you shake a swarm out of a tree. The queen's pheromone is so strong that even after you get the, the swarm, Bees are still hanging out around that tree. That's interesting. I've heard a lot of stories about how long these pheromones can just stick around. So in your bee suit, this uh, bee venom, alarm venom, is it, certainly something that can uh, stick around in your bee suit. Now, we all know that if you get stung, that alarm pheromone can trigger other bees to be there to sting you. That's not always the case. I mean, it's true that it could attract other bees, but I get stung working bees and I don't continue to get stung multiple times in that same location. It doesn't happen that way. But again, I've showed in my videos that you can smoke yourself a little bit uh, with your smoker to get some of the, break up the intensity of the alarm pheromone. And yeah, you can do the same on your suit. I don't know if you can just leave your suit. I don't do anything with my suits, but I don't really see stingers in my suits either. So good question. 
If in doubt, wash it. I do not wash my bee suits. I think I used to wash my bee suits when I first started because I wanted to be a really nice looking beekeeper. Look kind of pretty out there, but not anymore I don't. Man, I don't, I don't give a hoot about my uh, suits or jackets or gloves, you know. I just let them go, but yeah. Next comment says, I'm probably not understanding timeline correctly, but why wouldn't you have stopped the inspection once you saw queens? I feel like you saw eggs on this inspection. You knew your queen was there, and you could have torn it down or something. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, that's referring to an inspection video that I made where I, I, I found eggs, but I did not tear down the queen cells. I explained this in another video, by the way. And I, again, I realize you guys don't watch all my videos, but in another video, I explained the reason I didn't tear down those queen cells is because I didn't see the queen. I saw eggs, but not the queen. Now, normally we do say, if you see eggs, you don't have to find the queen. And I would say that works 99% of the time, 99.9. <laughs> but lo and behold, you know how bad luck can be. I was afraid that I would be that point one percent or whatever i thought oh shoot if i don't see the queen and those eggs were laid let's say five hours ago but then she died and i tore the queen cells down they don't have any way to raise a queen now but i get what you're saying because eggs in there means that they could always raise a new queen but like i mentioned in the videos i just wanted to put my i was kind of worrying about it because i love that queen and I just didn't want to do anything to that hive because it was still cold. It's, we were still in a very cold spell. There wasn't any way to manipulate frames or split it. I couldn't do much. It was just a kind of a warm-up day to take a peek. So I didn't want to disturb too much. But when it got a little warmer, I went in and we were able to verify the queen was there. Those are all valid questions. Yep. Yeah. Um, could you have put a queen excluder at the bottom of the hive to prevent the queen from leaving? I thought about that, actually. But that only kind of is a temporary fix and it doesn't tell you what's going on inside the hive. So you don't know if there's swarm cells, you don't know if the queen's okay, and so it's only a temporary thing until you can get in there. But yeah, yeah, that works good. David, if you see a queen cell that don't have anything in it, why don't you go ahead and destroy it? Yeah, I saw several questions like this on that same inspection, um, because during the season, I've noticed, and I've read, that there are always queen cups in your, in your hive. These are there in case of emergencies or something. They're always there. You'll often see them in your hive. And so if I went to the trouble to tear those down, they're just going to rebuild them. In fact, they can build a queen cell in less than 24 hours. So it really wasn't worthwhile. It, since I knew they were empty, they weren't building them out for any reason. I could tell they were there for a while. I just left them in there. Another comment said, if she is a bread queen, why destroy the cells? Why not make new nook if she is so good? Oh, I see. So the question is, if you love the queen, why not make a nook and put her in there? And then the cells would produce new queens in the parent colony. It's because, again, not the right time of the year to do that. Maybe I gave the wrong impression that this was a the middle of a season of bee activity, but this is uh, kind of coming out of winter, not really into spring yet, spring mode. So there's not, I can't make splits yet. I can't make a nucleus yet. It's too cold outside. So that was just me getting in there ahead of time to make sure there wasn't any swarming tendencies that were already started. Okay, does the queen lay an egg in the queen cup or do the bees make a queen cup from a cell with an egg in it? Yes. Next question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know what? There is a kind of a, a line drawn in the sand. There's, I mean, some people feel that the queen only lays eggs in those cups, and other people feel that, yes, she does, but also that bees carry the eggs and place them in that cup. Now, there's some literature that I've read by people that I highly respect, PhD entomologists and all that, who claim that the bees will carry the eggs and put those in there. But I have yet to really observe that, and I've yet to really see a solid study. I've just hit, heard references to it. So if you know of a solid study that's been done about this, let me know. Now, my friend John Zavishlock and I, we have talked about this, and we think we could easily create a scenario where bees, in order to raise a queen, would have to carry the eggs. And so we think we can generate that study and videotape it uh, maybe in an observation hive. That would be that would put this myth to rest and we could say absolutely they do, or in this case they didn't. So 50-50 um, on that, I, I, I don't know. I, I do know for sure 
that a queen can lay in that cup, but I don't know if the if the bees themselves are carrying the eggs and placing them into those cups. So I'm not sure about that one. How long would you leave the queen before allowing her to be replaced? I assume you mean how long would you use a queen in a hive before you get kind of fearful that she's too old? For me, it's usually two or three years, three, no more than three years. I just can't uh, risk going through the a winter with a three-year-old queen. Um, if she dies in the wintertime, that hive is uh, going to be, it's going to perish because um, I won't be able to requeen that hive in deep in, until deep into spring and they'll already be depleted in numbers. But three years is maximum for me on that one. Under what conditions would you not want to introduce a brood frame to a weak hive to avoid bees fighting? Um, there are a lot of conditions where this really doesn't matter. If the weak hive is queenless, in that case, it doesn't matter because uh, there's no queen pheromones to go around. Mostly, I've had such good luck giving weak colonies frames of brood, capped over brood, with bees on it. And the weaker the colony, the less likely they are to fight. And the earlier in the year, the less likely they are to fight as well. Bees get a little bit more protective during a, a dearth and hot summers and all that. But still, I've done it so many times and it's worked out really well. So I can't really say uh, what the conditions would be where this would not work other than uh, perhaps uh, during a fall dearth, bees are very protective. And then if you give them a frame of foreign bees uh, from another hive, then they might feel, you know, who are you? Um, because when we combine hives, we usually use that newspaper, uh, but oftentimes we're doing that because we've just pulled the queen away from the hive that we're combining the two together. So there's still a lot of QMP, queen mandibular pheromones to go around. Why not just always take action in spring and fall, testing or not, just treat? I get this question a lot. Some people feel like, uh, why test for mites? Why not just treat? If we know they're in there, just treat. Well, the reason is a couple of things come to mind. First of all, treatments are expensive and they, if you buy some, they have expiration dates on them. So you've got to use it all or you can't really store it. Some of those won't make it to the next season. So you waste your money on any excess that you buy. The other reason is because if you don't test first, you really don't know if your treatment worked. And there have been times when treatments haven't worked for some reason. So in other words, you want to test for mites, see what your numbers are. And if you have more than three per 100, three mites per 100 bees, then you might either make a note that you need to treat soon or treat after that. But then after you treat, you wait a week or two, and then you're going to test again to see how effective your treatment was. Because if the treatment wasn't effective, either because of the chemical was bad or the weather was weird or it didn't vaporize correctly, you know, a lot of reasons, then you may want it to treat again or use a different treatment. So that's why you want to test, treat, and test. Thanks, Dave. Always love your videos. Please help me understand the advantage of checkerboarding versus simply adding a honey super of drawn out comb. Why add the five frames of honey? Thanks, George. Yeah, George, uh, good question. I'm, I made a video about checkerboarding because oftentimes I make videos just explaining all the different things in beekeeping that um, people ask me about. And a lot of people wonder, a lot of people pursue things and they don't really understand them completely. So I made a video explaining checkerboarding. Now checkerboarding by explaining it, by making a video, I agree that there are some things of it that leave my mind wondering. And this is one of them as well. So, but I think, and I, you know, Walter Wright was the person that came up with the idea of checkerboarding. And I believe in understanding what he was saying and his followers and people that follow checkerboarding and still use it. What they say is that if the bees feel that the honey above them is not solid, like it's not sufficient, they see gaps in their honey, then they're more apt not to swarm but to fill those uh, frames that are checkerboarded, full frame of honey, empty frame of honey, full frame of honey, empty frame of honey, that it drives the bees crazy to see that, they just don't want to do it. Now, if you put a frame of, let's say, undrawn foundation above them to stop the swarm, most of us feel like that's just a desert, that the bees are still in swarm mode, they're going to swarm, they have honey down below in their deeps they can use to consume, to get ready to swarm. And so I too have seen um, I'm not going to say flaws, but I've seen some things in the checkerboarding technique to prevent swarming that uh, they, it could leave some gaps where I've seen bees swarm when they haven't had much honey at all on board, when they've had a mixture of solid above them or nothing at all. I've seen swarming under all conditions, but I'm not going to discredit checkerboarding because I really think if you, if you want to discredit it, you have to follow it exactly the way 
Walter Wright explains it, get your timing right, and then check it out to see if it works. But I agree, uh, George, it does leave a lot of questions like this. I have a jar feeder. I use a thumbtack to punch holes in the top. It seems like it drips too much. Will this drown the bees in sugar water? The holes are very small. A thumbtack is a very small hole, and I am shocked that it would leak. Here's what I would do. Take the lid off the jar and check the surface of the glass jar. See if it's smooth. Um, there could be imperfections in that lip, like a bump of, of glass, and it's not allowing the lid to sit properly. So make sure that that glass jar is smooth. Sometimes you can get a buildup of gunk or something. Next, I want you to check your jar lid. Now the jar lid, let me get one, ta-da. <laughs> so the jar lid actually has, let me bring it closer to you so you can see it. So the jar lid actually has this rubber gasket around it. Do you see that rubber gasket? And uh, now some of them may not have that, but I think most of them do, even your canny jar lids. So I think it's important then that you take your lid off and examine the lid. Just run your finger around the little uh, rubber and make sure that rubber is smooth. There's nothing, you know, up in there that's holding it from sealing. Because what we're trying to do is create a vacuum by having the lid on tight and the jar full and, you know, the holes being small at the bottom, enough air can't make its way up into the top of the jar to allow it to drip out. So that should be the case. But to answer your question, can that be bad for bees? This is dependent upon the amount of liquid leaking and how big your colony is. If your bees are really heavily populated and you're just dripping a little bit, I would think they could consume that and keep up with uh, the pace. But if it's a small colony and the drip is way beyond what they can consume, um, it could be bad for your bees. Although I would think the bees would get out of the way, it would drip through, but you don't want leaking jars of sugar water around your hive because that's gonna attract ants and robber bees and everybody else that loves dripping sugar. So uh, you don't want dripping sugar, but check those things out and see if you can find out why it's doing it. And if nothing works, I would try a different lid in a different jar. Hello, do you add additional wax foundation to your new frames? I add additional wax to the foundation. I think that's what you're meaning. And I've made, oh, a handful of videos. And I wrote an article in the Bee Culture magazine about this. And yes, that is the only way to go. Add more wax. And as you can see here in this video, this is from another video that I made, but you can see how I do it. And it just makes all the difference in the world. If you watch my videos, um, I think it was, yeah, it was last summer that I made, uh, I ran a test with uh, 10 frames. One of those I did not add additional wax to, and I put all 10 frames, and it might have been in July, I think. Yeah, and I put them in there. It wasn't really a heavy nectar flow. The one in the middle where the bees pull out first and fastest, I left it unwaxed. So that's the one I didn't wax. The rest of them I added extra wax to, went back, I don't know, what was it, a week or two later? They drew all the frames out perfectly, except the one in the middle with not the extra wax. They did nothing to it, nothing. So adding wax, helps like gold. You've got to do it. It's unbelievable. And I, I, if you don't have wax, I encourage people to buy it off Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description below if you need some wax to add to your frames. This is being added to plastic foundation. Hey, David, during the winter, can you move your bees to a greenhouse? Now, that's a good question. I actually talk about that in my overwintered online course that I sell. Um, yeah, I don't recommend that at all because in a greenhouse, any kind of light, Bees are drawn to, insects are drawn to light. And so the bees are drawn to the top of the greenhouse or a window in the greenhouse, however it's set up, they're drawn to the light. And they just stay there and beat themselves up silly trying to get through whatever is stopping them from getting outdoors out of that greenhouse. I think if the greenhouse was huge, you know, covered 10 acres, it would probably work pretty well if the ceiling was pretty high. But the typical greenhouse, hmm, it's just tough to keep bees in a greenhouse. Now, I've got a lot of more questions coming up, but I want to encourage you guys. Bobblehead David says, please subscribe. And so if you're uh, new to my channel here, I do appreciate you guys being here, listening to uh, answers to these questions. And I like making videos to help beekeepers out. You subscribe, you'll get a notification each time I make a video. If you click on the bell, and as always, give me a thumbs up. Now, I made a video recently about uh, what you, how you split hives. And I mentioned that when you split a hive and move it to a new location, that the, the foragers oftentimes get confused 
they go back to their parent hive. So here's a comment about that. Would slapping a robber screen on the new hive work to get them to reorientate to their new location? Um, the trouble with that is this. If they find their way out of the robber screen, and they will, as soon as the older foragers from the older location, the parent hive, get airborne and start flying around and doing their thing, they immediately go, aha, I know that tree, that telephone pole, that building, I know where I'm at, I know where my home is. And so they go back. So it's not so much them walking out and saying, that was weird having to walk through a, a robber screen, I better take a reorientation flight. It's the idea that once they get airborne, even though they may have reorientated their position, they may still go back to their original hive. But it's worth a try. I haven't tried it. To be honest with you, I never thought about that. It's not a bad idea because I do like putting things in front of my hives to make them take a new orientation flight. Um, something to try. I may try that this year. If you're going to do splits in the spring, do you need to wait until there are some drones available for the new queens to mate with? Absolutely. You sure do. I don't think anyone is going to be making splits, though, until it's warm enough. And when it's warm enough, those drones are always mature. They start raising drones uh, before they raise queens. Oh, that's actually called protandry. It means that the drones uh, mature before they start raising the queens. That's a good citizen scientist word, protandry. How many days can you leave the split before opening the hive? Was thinking to put my split in a nuke box and then tape shut for a couple of days with as many bees as possible, then move them 100 yards. Well, good question. I always fear confining bees in a box. That always scares me a little bit because I'm afraid they're gonna overheat, they need food and resources, they need to fly, defecate, all that. But, you know, on a rainy couple of days, the bees are confined to their boxes and they get along fine. But most times it rains, it's cloudy and cooler too. So a lot of conditions that I would have to uh, kind of hear what your situation is, but I would not want to put uh, my split into in like a five frame nuke box and then tape it shut with no air holes or anything. But I'm assuming you've probably have some ventilation. That's really going to be the critical part. Uh, taping the entrance shut, but maybe it has some ventilation on it, would probably be okay if they were kept in the shade um, for a day and a half. But I wouldn't go to much more, I wouldn't want to go much longer than that just because of all the things that I just said, they need to get out of there. I tried the Demeray method this year with a queen excluder under the top box. I pulled only frames that did not have eggs, so no new queens. I put the excluder on for insurance, no top entrance. Can the overwintered bees fit through the excluder? Good question. There's only two bees, types of bees, that cannot fit through the queen excluder. What are they, class? What are they, students? What are they, citizen scientists? What are the two bees that can't fit through a queen excluder? We all know it's the queen, one of them, because it's called a queen excluder. It can also be called a drone excluder because drones aren't very good at making it through there either. And so all the other bees make it through just fine, including your overwintered bees. Now, we do call them bees of winter physiology. We do say that they have more fat bodies in there for winter in their bodies, but that doesn't make them fat. They're not big and fat, but they just have more fat bodies. They have biotelogenesis, for example. So there's more stored protein in their fat bodies and their head and abdomen, but they're still no, they're no larger externally on their body, so they can still fit through the queen excluder just fine. That, that's a legitimate good question. What if we shake a few frames of nurse bees into the split to replace foragers that return to the old location? Also, if the old location gets most of the workers but not the queen, will that increase resource collection in the old location? All very good observations. Glad to see you thinking that way. I love it when I see beekeepers thinking through things like this. Excellent. Thank you for doing that, Michael, I think. So, yeah, so that would be helpful. If you shook nurse bees into your split, then the nurse bees likely are not going to be able to ever want to fly out and back to their old home. I have seen nurse bees fly back to their house because some of those as some of those are able, if it's not too far away, you know, they just are able to do that. But they take, you know, they defecate and such outside the hive. But for the most part, uh, that might really be a good plan. Shake some nurse bees. Now, how do you find nurse bees? You've got to look for bees on open brood. Open brood are eggs and larvae, not cat brood. But open brood, the nurse bees are feeding them. That's how we know that they're there as nurse bees. So in this case, yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Now, <clears throat> what's really critical about this is that the nurse bees are going to be between the ages of 6 to 11 or 12 days old. 
and they start foraging in about another 10 or 11 days. So if you shake nurse bees in there that say are 10 years old, then in 13 days later, two weeks, they are foragers. You still gotta wait two weeks. So yeah, that's, it's helpful. And your other question was good too, if the older location gets most of the workers but not the queen, will it increase resources? Absolutely. Many people do this as a technique to get more honey. They pull their queen during a strong honey flow. And that reduces the amount of energy used in other, uh, on brood and such. And so the bees just go crazy making more honey. So yeah, it will make more honey. A queenless colony, as you have probably already experienced, can really go crazy making a lot of honey. Uh, feeders for 11:24. I assume you put feeders on on April the 11th. And uh, when, oh, when will your A-frame feeders be available? Website says out of stock. Yeah, that's something that I have no uh, jurisdiction or control over. I'm not um, able to really keep uh, tabs on that. Uh, my staff does keep my website going, inventory orders and all that. Um, so I'm clueless about things like that. Thanks for, by the way, thanks for being interested in our feeders. I appreciate that. You are my favorite person on YouTube and thanks for all you do. I've learned a ton. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh my gosh, that's encouraging. Okay, I'm not gonna quit making YouTube videos after I heard that. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, do you believe checkerboarding is as effective with horizontal hives? Oh gosh, I did think about this and I think it could be, I really do. If the, if the theory is the same, whether it's vertical or horizontal, if the theory is that bees don't wanna swarm unless they have a big solid block of honey above them or behind them in a horizontal hive, the theory could stand true in horizontal hives, I guess. I guess I, I have to admit, I don't know. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with horizontal hives. All mine are vertical, traditional Langstroth hives. What if you turn the new hive 180 degrees? Does that help? Yeah, we're back to talking about how do we keep foragers in the splint if we move them? If we tilt it 180 degrees, like turn it backwards, will that help? It could. And I think I've done that successfully. One of the best techniques that I've ever used is, uh, I think it was on uh, this building back here, it goes further back that way. Uh, but back in there somewhere, I made a split when I, I had a bunch of hives on this side of the building and I put my splits on this side of the building and there wasn't a single forager that went back to the old colony. The reorientation around that building was phenomenal. So whatever that means, right? <laughs> There's something there. It worked out really well. I've been told not to hold frames with queen cells upside down as it will kill it. Is that true? Okay, so what we're talking about is you pull out a frame and there's a queen cell on there and it's capped over queen cell. And if you hold the frame upside down, uh, will it kill the queen? Here's the deal with that. The queen cell, let's pretend that this is the queen cell. You know, it's in this uh, vertical position. You can actually damage the queen in there in, in the early, when, it, it, I guess in the pupa stage is when it's most critical. Um, if you tilt it even, you don't have to turn it upside down because it's suspended in there, it's, it's such a way in that cocoon that its wings have to develop. And by sloshing it around, you can actually cause the wings to get caught in places against things that they shouldn't be and actually damage the queen. Now, I used to, before I knew this, um, I used to, and I was a very, very new beekeeper. I would see queen cells, I'd cut them out. I would open up my shirt pocket. I'd put my queen cells in my shirt pocket and go about my bee inspections and, Later on, an hour or two, I'd take my queen cells out of my pocket and punch them in somewhere. And lo and behold, most of them didn't work out. They died. And I was like, wonder why they died for. I just didn't have enough bee biology to know that number one, they needed to be kept 98 degrees. And number two, you can't slosh them around like that. Now you can on maybe day 13 or 14, closer to when they're no longer sleeping and they start to get ready to emerge. You can move them around, I'd say day 14 and a half to day 15. But earlier than that, yeah, you're gonna cause damage. But I think most beekeepers do it. I've done it without knowing there's a queen cell on the other side. You pull a frame up, there's a queen cell over here, and you look at it, and then you flip it over, and uh-oh, you got a queen cell upside down. So it doesn't always have to kill her. Um, it may not always, but you just don't wanna make that a practice that you're careless with. Thank you for a wonderful video. Why move the split at all? What would happen if you just leave the new split right next to the original? one and shook some bees to nurse the developing brood will all the girls just go back to the original hive um i don't know but i'm assuming yes by my 
30 plus years of playing with bees, or almost 30 years of playing with bees, uh, the foragers are going to want to go back in the same location. Absolutely. And remember, you've seen me make videos where I can move a hive just six inches and the foragers are totally confused. And now they don't know where to go anymore, just six inches. And so I, I think it's fine if you want to make a split and put it right next to your hive. I would not do that because the reason I make a split and move it away is because of my need. I need my hives to be separated so I can work around them. Now, if you moved your new split, you know, enough, far enough away for you to uh, work between there, whether you're working this hive or that hive, you need about three feet gap there to make it comfortable for you. And the bees are never going to find that each other. Uh, that, that's too, that's too far of a distance. Yeah. They don't work like we do. <laughs> um, but you could do that. I mean, you you don't have to walk away and carry your new split far away. You can put it anywhere you want to. And putting nurse bees in there, like we said earlier, is going to help. But the foragers are probably going to go back to the parent colony. Oh, here's a good question. If I do not want to expand my tiny apiary, is it okay to let them swarm, assuming bees left behind will make a new queen and prosper? I've talked about this. I actually made a video a month or so ago, and the video was all about what do you do if you don't want to expand your colony. I think I wrote an article in Bee Culture about this as well. I write a monthly column in Bee Culture, by the way. It's a great magazine. It's been around since 1873 or 6, and so uh, um, I enjoy writing articles uh, for them. And I wrote about this. What if you don't want to expand? Because most beekeepers, you know, are hungry to expand. And if you don't want to expand, is that okay? Okay. The worst part about this is if you let your bees swarm and you live in a city, that swarm might bring fear to people who don't understand bees. They might see bees in a big roaring cloud and they might think they're going to all, you know, just be killed or something. I don't know what's going on out there, but it's loud. Something, something, I must have got hit with one of those, um, what do they call them? Dirt devils? These, you know, tornadoes <laughs> across the fields that come roaring across. They're not really tornadoes, but they're dirt devils. And then they hit you. I was cycling the other day. And I saw a dirt devil, but I didn't think it was going to intersect with me. And it did. And it, I almost lost control of my bike. And it's really bad for me because I already had a crosswind. And for those of you that cycle, I have a carbon bike with carbon wheels. The wheels are a little bit bigger. And so a crosswind is terrible. I think my bike only weighs, what, 11 or 12 pounds. And I was on gravel. Oh, my gosh, I thought it was over. I mean, that thing, I had... They're just a dirt devil. If you don't know what dirt devils are, <laughs> uh, it sounded like one just hit around here. I heard metal flying and all that. So I have to go out there and look in a minute. But um, yeah, I think, you know, these swarms that go into cities really make people scared. And, and so that's the only reason I would say it's better if you're in an urban environment. That if you can control your swarms, it's much nicer uh, to give bees a better name, I guess. But other than that, if you're out in the country like I am and you lose the swarm and there they go off to the trees, eh, it doesn't really matter. You're right. The bees left behind. They already had queen cells or they wouldn't have swarmed. So they're going to raise new queens anyway. And that way you keep a tiny little apiary. Sure, you can do that. Why not? Do you have any idea? Is this our last question? It is. Wow. Do you have any idea on how long it takes for a hive to fill the deep frames in a horizontal hive? I know there are several variables. On strong, would you be able to collect honey one a year, twice per year? Thanks. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Well, um, so it collecting honey is going to depend largely on the age of your hive. The first year hives, we always like to say, don't count on any extra honey because they're having to build a lot of comb. They're having to use their nectar and honey to build comb. It makes uh, They consume the honey and uh, to make wax from their wax plants. So... When they have all their comb built out, they're more able to make more honey, store it, and that's usually their second year. So there are a lot of variables, like you said. Absolutely there are. If you're in a tremendous area where there's a lot of resources and there's just a lot of nectar, and the nectar uh, presents itself over months and months and months, April, May, June, July, August, like it does here in Illinois, yeah, you can make a lot of honey, and absolutely you can have two harvest periods. You could have uh, maybe late spring or early summer harvest, and then you could have your fall harvest. But most places, most people that I know of only have one uh, period of honey flow, I guess, and it doesn't last too long. And so it depends on where you live. It really does. Horizontal hive or vertical is, I don't think it's going to make any difference. My vertical hive last year did really well packing away a lot of honey. 
and but so do my vertical hives as well. So I'm not sure if it's going to make much difference. If you're trying to make a decision on whether you want to go vertical or horizontal, I have made some cool videos about that, which is better, the horizontal or vertical. Be sure and watch those. But the different types of hives often high, oftentimes have to do with the beekeeper. Like what is it easier for us to manage? And horizontal hives are easier for beekeepers that don't want to lift heavy boxes. In, in fact, I've made a video about that. I'd like to, for you to watch this. I took a whole bunch of different scenarios and hives and explained the pros and cons. I'll see you over here.